When people speak of famous or legendary ships, there is an air to how we talk about them or refer to them. Some tell tales of tragedy like the mighty battlecruiser Hood. Others tell tales of heroism like that of USS Enterprise. These stories give us the character of the ship. And there is one ship in history, more than any other, that earned the title of the infamous. Her very presence forced the world's strongest navy to commit the bulk of its surface fleet to her destruction. One might say, she was made to rule the waves across the seven seas. Made to lead a war machine. Even though this ship bore the name of what amounts to her country's founder, if you search the name online and in books, you don't find the namesake you find the ship itself. Come on guys, I don't really need to say the name. You all know, it could only be one ship. As with all things in Germany in the 1930s, the Versailles Treaty hung over those making state policy like the Sword of Damocles, waiting to strike down and destroy any plans for national resurgence. The Washington Naval Treaty, meanwhile, had been put in place to keep things under control among all the world's sea powers, but it was steadily becoming clear that those with imperialistic ambitions were starting to reconsider their position on the arrangements. Namely, the Japanese Navy Fleet Faction, as well as Italy's Regia Marina. The Reichsmarine, the obvious predecessor to the Kriegsmarine, knew for a fact that if Japan and Italy did not abide by their agreements, which, to be honest, they expected them not to, then the Allies would almost certainly respond with their own large vessels. Thus, plans were drawn up for a ship to keep pace with these new developments. These designs would eventually form the basis for what would become the Bismarck-class battleship. As always, though, the Versailles Treaty was a particularly thorny problem for the Kriegsmarine, and as such, design and preparations for the construction had been done clandestinely. Given that preparations for war were already underway before the Nazis took power, agreements were made with the other European powers, the main one being, of course, the Soviet Union, to evade European observers, allowing for research to be done in all fields of warfare without arousing suspicion. That being said, I'm pretty sure all the staff at European airports in the 30s were wondering why they never ever saw the same Lufthansa pilot twice. Huh, weird, right? Almost as if you were wanting to build a secret air force or something. <laughs> in any case, this all picked up speed as in, out of nowhere, from the right wing, comes the Munich bullet magnet himself, who decided that it was time to go public. With rearmament now being very much the order of the day, Germany approached Britain with a proposal to permit Germany's entry into the Washington Naval Treaty system via their own unique agreement, an agreement unimaginatively titled the Anglo-German Naval Treaty. I know, shocking creativity from our artistic genius in Berlin. The short version is, the treaty essentially allowed Germany to build a navy 35% the size of the Royal Navy, which sounds fair enough to the British. However, for the other European powers, this was rather disconcerting, as the common vernacular for describing the Royal Navy is fucking huge. And as such, 35%, while not a threat to the British, puts Germany roughly on par with everyone else. That, of course, didn't please the French, as you can well imagine. But just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, Japan withdrew from the agreement entirely, invoking the Escalator Clause, which meant everyone now had license to build ships up to a level of 45,000 tons. And so, when Admiral Raider and the Kriegsmarine Planning Department submitted the epically named Z-Plan to everyone's favourite art school reject, the heaviest capital ships in the initial building phase were two very large but very fast battleships 
that were already nearing the end of their planning phase. One of them would be named Tirpitz, after the Grand Admiral of the Imperial German Navy, Alfred von Tirpitz. It was somewhat appropriate that his name should adorn one of the first heavy battleships in Plan Z, as it was he who was responsible for the creation of the German High Seas Fleet during the lead-up to World War I. However, the lead ship that would grant this class of vessel its name would carry an even greater honour, as this ship would bear the name of the man responsible for a united Germany. In essence, the very founder of what became the Reich itself. It bore the name of the Iron Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck. And much like her namesake, this ship had a plan. Bismarck always has a plan. But before we go into that plan, let's talk about the ship itself. Which, in a weird way, is me getting to channel my inner Adam Savage, because we are going to be doing some myth-busting. Now, in my previous video about Prinz Eugen, I made several errors, and you can check the pinned post of that video to see what they were. But, with enough chastising from the history nerds over at the Azure Lane Discord's History Club, shout out to you guys, you're fucking awesome, I gleaned some valuable information and some sources, so I went digging. And oh boy, was the propaganda fun on this one. You see, the German press made Bismarck out to be something akin to Yamato. A titanic ship, dwarfing all around it with gigantic guns, impenetrable armour and unmatched modernity, the pinnacle of global sea power and the finest capital ship in Europe. And it's true, she was the biggest battleship in Europe at the time. But not by a lot. Not really. The British press, meanwhile, painted this ship in a similar light, only to be the boogeyman of the navy, the leviathan of the Reich, coming to sweep the seas of the Royal Navy and starve Britain into submission. Pre-war, this gets the Royal Navy more funding, as if it needed any more, and during the war it would give them the political justification for more naval assets to use in the Atlantic, because at the time, the Mediterranean and North African operations were seriously draining capital ships from convoy escorts and the home fleet. Also, another big upside is, if we can beat this thing, which we most likely can, we're going to look so good in the papers that morale on the home front will skyrocket, and everyone will forget or at least be distracted from the fact that we just lost all of continental Europe and Rommel is currently kicking the shit out of us in Africa, but we're not talking about that right now. So to this day, the Bismarck and Tirpitz have been painted as these gigantic death machines, superior to anything in the Allied arsenal, which, should they be allowed to sail, will spell death to our brave boys on the high seas. The reality, however, was nothing so glamorous. In fact, I'd even call the reality a little bit disappointing. And that's not to say that Bismarck was a bad ship, or somehow weak. Not at all. She was indeed one of the most powerful battleships of her time, and one of, if not the, most expensive investment in Germany's naval history, costing 196 million Reichsmarks. Which, uh, after me and a friend got incredibly bored, worked out that it's about 1.6 billion US dollars in today's money. And if she was allowed to sortie at will into the Atlantic in support of the other surface raiders like Eugen, Scharnhorst and Eisenau, the damage to the convoys in conjunction with the U-boat threat could end up causing catastrophic delays in further Allied operations, threaten food shipments to Britain and seriously damage her morale. But the propaganda surrounding her conjures up images of superiority when in actuality she was simply on par with her contemporaries. Anyway, it's about time to give the rundown on this Terror of the Seas. To start off, let's talk about her strengths, and there is no shortage of them. First of them being what her little sisters, Scharnhorst and Neisenau, are famous for when compared to Royal Navy capital ships. Speed. Bismarck was classed as a fast battleship i.e. a battleship that has comparable speed to cruisers and destroyers without compromising too much on armour protection. Bismarck's propulsion system of three gigantic Blom and Voss steam turbines pushed the 44,000 ton ship 
at a speed of 30 knots. A speed which ships of similar class and purpose couldn't reach with the exception of the French Reichelier class, which could reach 32.5 knots on a good day. This meant that in a raw chase, the Bismarck could outpace all but the latest and fastest British capital ships. The only ships that could keep up with her were the King George V class ships like Prince of Wales, or of course, the mighty battlecruiser Hood. You never know, we might run into them later. And even then, she was still faster than both. Then there were her properties as a gun platform. Bismarck was wide. Like, really wide. And I mean, I know I said Prince Eugen was thick, but damn. Coming in with a beam of 36 meters at her widest, fanning out in an oval shape. Other ships at the time were usually in the high 20s, while the latest Royal Navy battleships came in at around 32 to 34. This combined with her massive displacement made her incredibly stable, with very little rolling or pitching even in the roughest of seas. The amazing thing about this is, is that because her rudder was also incredibly effective, she could turn tighter than other ships her size and still maintain a gun solution. Speaking of, her fire control systems meanwhile were somehow even more formidable, with 14 Zeiss made rangefinders of varying size and purpose, the largest of which being reportedly capable of ranging targets with an accuracy of 50 meters at ranges of up to 20 kilometers. Uh, that's uh, 12 and a half miles for you colonial tea vandals. Finally, there was the centerpiece atop her mast, the FUMO-23 SeaTact radar system. This unit was capable of extended range search in optimal conditions, but eh, most of the time it was really only useful during bad weather, with range at around 11 kilometers, 6.8 miles, which for naval radar is pretty crap, to be honest. However, what the Germans lacked in range for their radar, again, they shone with ranging, with an accuracy even closer than that of her optical rangefinders. While Bismarck's hydrophone sets, which had been developed for the U-boat force, had excellent capabilities, they were capable in the cold and deep waters of the North Atlantic of calculating bearing to within one degree, at least going by U-boat reports of the same sets. And then there is what she was shooting with. The Bismarck has 15-inch guns firing 1,800-pound shells at a muzzle velocity of 2,700 feet per second. This high muzzle velocity and heavy shell is a very good balance of both accuracy at distance and damage on impact. It's not as good as the guns on the Nelson-class ships and is on par or maybe even a tiny bit better than Hood's guns, but definitely no joke. Combine these factors together and you have a terrifyingly accurate shooting platform, which allows Bismarck to employ her main armament very effectively. As the song famously says, firing shells as big as steers from guns as big as trees. You know, it really is a truly remarkable ship, the Bismarck, especially for a ship designed after a moratorium was placed on German battleship design. I mean, just, just think about all these technically exceptional German engineering projects. Like, the equipment here is phenomenal. The radar, the hydrophone sets, the electronics, the fire control cabling, the intricacy and complexity of the Bismarck design. And the best part about it is when you think of German engineering in World War II, the words that come to mind are efficiency and reliability. It's known for breaking easily. Oh man, we did it again! Hey Hoshino, put it out! Yeah, moving on. And finally, what is considered to be Bismarck's most well-known feature? Her armor. 19,000 metric tons of her weight were devoted to the armor on this ship, with a citadel structure covering 70% of the vessel. Essentially, from the forward gun turret Anton to the aftermost turret Dora, Bismarck had full armor protection all the way along, and this protection was insane. While it was of a conventional design with certain drawbacks, the same drawbacks that a Dreadnought design has, 
it was still using the latest technology in steel from Krupp, with a turtle back slope from the waterline up to the main deck, which meant she was very effective at close range. The armor was well spaced, reinforced, and intricate. Essentially, shooting at this thing along the primary armor belt would result in the crew laughing at you and then returning fire. And its effectiveness was compounded by the fact that accepting the components that had to be mounted externally in the superstructure or on the extremities, every crucial component of Bismarck's operations, munitions, and machinery spaces were housed deep inside this citadel. To give you a true idea of just how ridiculous the armor on this ship is, the only ship designed or built in or in service at this time with more armor than Bismarck was the Yamato at 22,000 metric tons, and in the case of Yamato, only 33% of its weight was armor. I could go into all the technical specifications about the armor layout, but suffice to say, as seen on this table here, while the Royal Navy ships may have more armor in some areas specifically, and have more modern design features, overall and on balance, the armor on Bismarck is comprehensive, and quite frankly, fucking impressive. Who knows? We may even get to see a demonstration of it. However, given that I started this section by talking about how she wasn't as powerful as the propaganda makes out, it is clear that there are some definite drawbacks to her design. Though some could be considered more as trade-offs rather than flaws. The first of which is her wide beam and large rudder combination. While this does wonders for her maneuverability at speed on the open sea, in shore, Bismarck has considerable problems with mobility. She often required multiple tugs to get into proper position, and it was quite the operation to do smaller movements. But this issue doesn't have as much of an impact on combat compared to something else. What does cause a problem is the fact that she suffers from apocalyptic levels of hydrodynamic drag. Now, while I'm doing a series on ships, I am first and foremost an aviation guy with a particular love for carrier aviation, which is how I ended up here doing this. So forgive me for using an aviation example. Bismarck suffers from the same exact issue that befalls Delta Wing fighter aircraft like the Mirage. With her strong nose authority and incredible amount of lift, a Delta Wing fighter can bring its nose around and change direction very quickly. Bismarck, with her speed and rudder authority, can do the same, but both run into the same problem. When performing maneuvers with aggression, such as evading a missile or a torpedo, the same design features that make them so effective also render them in serious danger, as the massive frontage of the vehicle is now exposing its entire surface area to the point of resistance, that being the air or water in its direction of travel. For an aircraft, this induces a high level drop in speed, resulting in a stall. For a battleship, it results in slowing down to almost a complete stop when performing an evasive action. And given that Bismarck is so wide and heavy, once slowed to a near stop, her momentum will carry her on regardless of your control inputs, and, more importantly, at full combat load, she weighs 50,000 tons. You can be as fast as you want, that is going to take a fuckload of power and time to get back up to speed. And while in that slowed state, you are a sitting duck. But hey, you can always fight your way out, right? <sighs> well, here's the other problem. Bismarck's guns fire a big shell with high muzzle velocity. It's the best of both worlds because you maintain accuracy while hitting hard. But the focus the Germans put on gunnery meant the design of her armament had serious drawbacks. The individual guns were spaced out in the turret to ensure that when firing, one gun's muzzle blast would not interfere with that of the other, as well as allowing for more accurate calibration of individual guns for independent fire, as well as of course simplifying the gunnery control. This made them more accurate and easier to aim and easier to range, but it also increased dispersion, which meant less concentration of fire and less steel on target. But there was an even bigger problem than this. The overt focus on accuracy and simplification of rangefinding, as well as a rare, and I mean incredibly rare, 
deference for reliability, for German engineers anyway, meant that Bismarck's design was only capable of fitting four twin turrets. Almost all other major battleships of the time fitted triple or even quadruple gun turrets in a superset configuration. You then have to factor in that Bismarck was sailing with the Kriegsmarine, which by its doctrine, as well as the simple economic reality of Germany, would always be outnumbered. The result is that in every engagement Bismarck historically fought, or could theoretically end up fighting in, she would always be inferior in the number of guns she could bring to the fight. But hey, compared to her strengths, those weaknesses aren't too bad. Yeah? Hi, yeah, this is the shipyard. Uh, we have an issue. What? Well, thing is, we're running into problems finalising the construction. How so? What's the problem? Yeah, problem is, Chief, uh, we're running close to the weight limit, and we can't maintain the armour coverage all the way along. And given that, we're going to have to cut back armour and structural integrity in the extremities. For fuck's sake, mate, we left the treaty. you have That's bullshit. You've still got plenty of space and tonnage to work with. Yeah, nah, boss. Not if you want to fit in the keel canal. You'll scrape off the bottom or worse, get jammed in there. Could you imagine what getting a massive tonnage ship wedged in a major shipping canal could cause? Alright, 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 fine. Where'd you get up to? Well, we sit it out 70% of the ship, uh, but the, you see, the problem is, because of the strong core structure, the external structures are pretty weak, especially around the aft section. She's got a lot of weight there with the steering gear and all that shit, but she's only got minimal armor protection because of the weight restrictions. Mate, it's the steering gear. Can't you put some more armor on it? Not unless you want to be a lighthouse with attitude. Also, should mention that to operate the rangefinders and the radar, uh, we had to run the cabling for those through the superstructure itself instead of under the citadel. <sighs> all right, all right. Don't worry about it, mate. Don't worry about it, okay? Look, after all, this ship can go 30 knots and it can turn on a dime. We can't afford to compromise the agility of the ship by up-armoring the bow, and the rudder authority can't be compromised either. Look, the steering compartment will be fine. We can do a 90 degree turn doing 30 knots and still fire our guns. Not to mention, we also have one of the lowest silhouettes of modern battleships. We sit really low in the water compared to the others. Torpedo attacks would be useless, and we're harder to hit. And, given our guns, we should be able to sink any ship we engage. The chances of the British scoring a direct hit on our bow or our steering gear are damn near impossible, so just finish it up, launch it, we'll deal with it later. In the business, we call this foreshadowing. On the 14th of February 1939, to much fanfare, at the behest of the man with the world's worst side fringe, Bismarck was launched into the Hamburg waterways to begin her outfitting process. This took considerable time, given the ship's complexity, and it wasn't until August 24th, 1940, that Bismarck would be commissioned into the Kriegsmarine to commence her sea trials. And it was at this time that a rather strange friendship would be made. In the shipyard alongside Bismarck, during her final workups and commissioning, she was neighbours with the U-boat U-556. The crews knew each other, and as a result, to the extent that when it came time to commission U-556, Captain Lindemann, upon finding out they didn't have a band to mark the occasion, lent them Bismarck's. From there on, there was a kinship between the two vessels and their crews, which is actually represented in Agile Lane's lore and her artwork. Anyway... Testing began on Bismarck, and an interesting flaw was discovered. It was found that, due to the beam and weight of the ship as well as the placement of the screws, Bismarck had serious issues using alternating power to steer the ship. Even with full alternate thrust, the ship only barely turned. But hey, with a fully functioning rudder, not a problem. Germany needs every ship she can get. 
Bismarck finished up her sea trials and headed back to Kiel for final replenishment and outfitting, as well as to make some modifications as required. On her way back, however, she ran aground in the canal. I fucking warned you, dickheads! It was okay, though, because she got freed quickly and made port soon after. While all this was happening, however, there were strange things afoot at the Circle Creeks Marine. Admiral Radom and the planning staff were coming up with a new plan. A bold plan. In fact, it was quite possibly an insane plan. It would be the largest surface force deployed by Germany since the invasion of Norway. And it wouldn't be in territorial waters this time. Oh no. This was a sortie into the Atlantic to do battle with the Royal Navy as well as to sink a lot of merchant shipping. Their name for it was Exercise Rhein, or Operation Rhein Übung in German, and it was going to be epic. Just think, we have Scharnhorst, Neisenau, Admiral Hipper, Bismarck, Prince Eugen, and Tirpitz is coming down the line a few months after. Think about it, with all these surface raiders sailing together, the entire German capital fleet at sea, it will lay waste to the convoy system and send the Royal Navy running, and final victory- Oh no. No, 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 not again, not again, NOT AGAIN! You know... Whenever we talk about the Kriegsmarine surface fleet, this is going to be a running gag. Just warning you now. However, in this case, it wasn't actually Bismarck. It was everyone else. Pretty much all the heavy cruisers, except Prince Eugen, because she'd already been hit, as well as Scharnhorst and Eisenhower in Brest, had either been hit by RAF bombers, or the construction yards in Tirpitz's case, or the supply depots needed for repairs were hit. And not only that, German waterways were constantly being mined and having merchants sunk in them. As a result, operational planning for the German fleet was, to put it bluntly, it was way past Shit Creek. It was up Scheiss Canal. However, with mounting pressure from the angry Viennese manlet to inflict damage on the British convoy network, as well as the upcoming invasion of the USSR threatening to take up all of their assets, Raider and co. were committed to commencing operations regardless of the situation. As such, Exercise Rhine would go ahead with only two ships, Prince Eugen and Battleship Bismarck. And so, after the final preparations were completed and prize crews came aboard, Bismarck sailed at 0200 on the 19th of May, meeting up with Prince Eugen later that morning, as well as a destroyer and minesweeper flotilla led by Z23. With the Luftwaffe firmly overhead, they streamed northwest towards the Katakat, all the while making preparations both physically and mentally to do battle with the world's largest and most experienced navy. As they did so, Swedish naval and air units shadowed the flotilla, their contact reports being both detailed and regular. At 1pm on the 20th of May, the Swedish cruiser Gotland made the following report. Two large ships, three destroyers, five escort vessels, and 10 to 12 aircraft spotted, passing Marstrand, course 205 degrees by 20. Bismarck's bridge crew had spotted the ship and picked up her transmissions. They realised it was now only a matter of time before the British naval attaché in Sweden was informed, and so the German ships were ordered onto a standing alert. Their cover was blown. It had to be. And because of this, both Captain Lindemann and Admiral Lutjens knew that fire and fury was about to descend upon them. The famous words of Paul Revere that were cried out to safeguard American liberty 160 years prior, those famous words were now turned to a new purpose. Those same words now heralded the impending doom of Nazi sea power. The British are coming.
it didn't take long. The famous Bletchley Park codebreakers had been watching events unfold with interest, and with the Swedish report confirming their suspicions of an Atlantic raid in progress, RAF recon Spitfires arrived overhead soon after. The photos were on Admiral Tovey's desk as soon as they left the development room, and sure enough, Bismarck and Prince Eugen were clearly in frame and on their way west. Across naval base Scarpa flow came whistles and sirens, the yelling of NCOs and the frantic exchange of morse between captains. Those noises were omnipresent as boilers warmed up and crews stood too. The British home fleet was gearing up for battle and at their front were both their newest battleship and the pride of the navy. Battleship Prince of Wales and the mighty battlecruiser Hood. They were both ordered to sail with all speed to reinforce the cruiser patrol currently patrolling the Denmark Strait, the most likely course for the German ships to take. In fact, they left in such a hurry, Prince of Wales left with civilian contractors still ironing out the kinks in her guns. Prince of Wales formed up on her famous partner and set course northwest. No one knew, not the captains, not the crews, perhaps not even the gods themselves, none of them knew what was to come. The coming days would decide the fates of thousands, if not millions. Bismarck and Prince Eugen, meanwhile, were plunging through the cold arctic waters to the north, zigzagging to avoid ice flows and constantly on watch for the Royal Navy. They entered the Denmark Strait on the morning of the 23rd of May. Knowing that there were British patrols through here, Lutjens ordered their radars on and to increase speed to 27 knots. They were going to dash through the Denmark Strait and break out into open waters as fast as they could. With any luck, they'd evade the home fleet and start hitting convoys. Unfortunately for them, though, they were being watched. Peeking out from a fog bank, with the crew no doubt shitting themselves, HMS Suffolk made visual and radar contact with the German formation, immediately reporting their position to headquarters before rapidly retreating out of range. The Germans, meanwhile, saw Suffolk as well, and heard it on their hydrophones. They got an accurate fix, and they wanted to shoot but given the weather conditions, accurate fire would be damn near impossible, and so Suffolk began to shadow them as they forged ahead. What was a probability now became a certainty. The Royal Navy would come for them now, and it was now only a matter of when. The first ship that arrived on the scene, however, was something not as impressive as they expected. Who would arrive, but none other, than Suffolk's sister ship, Norfolk. Yes, their guns were useless, and getting into torpedo range would not be advisable, but having friends around is always good, and, let's be honest, dying together is better than dying alone. Which, apparently, was Norfolk's plan anyway, as she attempted to get a closer look. The intermittent radar contact and the bad weather meant Suffolk had lost contact with the formation temporarily, this would be important later as it would mean that British course and speed information about Bismarck and Prince Eugen would be incorrect. But what happened now would even more drastically affect the upcoming battles. Norfolk, unaware, began closing on the group and drifted too close. Bismarck, having seen her approach, had a solid gun solution and fired a full salvo. Rather impressively, bracketing her on the first shot. Norfolk, her crew now needing a complete uniform change, made smoke and vanished back into the fog bank as fast as she could go, shell splinters raining over her decks. Now, normally, such accurate gunnery would be a cause for celebration. Regardless of the fact that their target got away, they proved that their guns and their rangefinders were as deadly as they claimed. However, the gunnery officers were currently furious. Why? Due to a design flaw, yes, another one, Bismarck's gun placement had caused the shockwave of the main guns to knock out her radar 
completely beyond repair. Bismarck was now reduced to visual contact only. And so now, Lutjens ordered Prince Eugen to take the lead in the formation, and for the ships to kick it up to all ahead full. They needed to leave, and they needed to leave quickly. If we could get out of here in time, we may just be able to break out. But as dawn broke, and the fog cleared, it became way too obvious that it was far too late. As the horizon brightened, lookouts on Bismarck called out smoke on the horizon. They were two very large smoke plumes as well, obviously coming from large battleships at battle speed. And at 0545, the lookouts made visual contact. Two capital ships were spotted, the larger of the two sporting a quadruple turret. However, on sighting the lead ship, the blood in their veins turned to ice. What they saw was a battle cruiser at flank speed, with guns just as big as theirs, her white ensign fluttering in the breeze. During their training in the Baltic Sea, every exercise they had run, everything they had done, was in the practice to face this ship. She was her arch rival. Every exercise was geared towards fighting her. Standing before them, sailing into harm's way, was the mighty battlecruiser Hood. Action stations were sounded across both task forces as the main batteries came online. Courses were plotted and ranges estimated. However, something was wrong in the British camp. Admiral Holland was horrified to note that their range and bearing towards Bismarck was wrong. She was further ahead than she should be. That moment of lost contact had not accounted for her change in speed, and now Bismarck and Prince Eugen were crossing the T in front of the British formation, and it didn't stop there. He had hoped to be broadside on and at closer ranges when combat commenced. However, with the different speed and weather conditions, they were out of position. For Prince of Wales, this was fine, but not for Hood. Her planned refit had not been done in time for hostilities to commence in 1939, and as such, her upper armour and deck protection were far too weak for a modern capital ship engagement. This gave Holland one choice. Turning the formation for a direct intercept course, he increased to flank speed. They had to get close enough to A, make their guns more effective against Bismarck's superior armour, and B, remove the threat of arcing fire that would spell doom for Hood. However, this meant only the forward guns on their ships could fire, and worse still, with their targets directly in front of them, the spray from their advance at high speed meant their secondary rangefinder amidships had to be used, and their solutions recalculated. But for the experienced Royal Navy sailors, this wasn't really a problem. They acquired the lead ship and fired. However, due to the engagement the previous night, it wasn't Bismarck, but Prince Eugen in the lead, and she returned fire with her customary venom and zeal. Meanwhile, on the bridge of Prince of Wales, the captain, Mr. Leach, noticed the discrepancy in size between the two ships and, realising Admiral Holland's mistake, ordered fire on the Bismarck. It was Prince Eugen who scored first blood, with a shell hitting Hood's primary anti-air munitions locker, starting a furious blaze and killing several crew. But despite the hail of shells coming from the Royal Navy, Bismarck's guns remained silent. Then, Prince of Wales found her mark, as a shell punched through Bismarck's bow section, holding one of the main fuel tanks and sending oil torrenting into the Atlantic. The other shots in this salvo wrecked the catapult for their AR-196 spotter aircraft, and in an incredibly lucky shot, one of the other shells had fallen short and detonated underwater underneath the main armor belt, flooding one of the generator rooms while threatening a boiler. Royal Navy gunnery and a bit of luck had managed to hit Bismarck in her only vulnerable areas. They were... it was just incredible shooting, and as I said, a little bit of luck. And yet, with all this, Bismarck still held fire. 
Admiral Lutjens had not responded to the request to engage, and even though Prince Eugen was eagerly sending rounds downrange like an orc from 40k at the Royal Navy boys, Captain Lindemann, frustrated with his commanding officers in action and angry at the damage to his ship, turned around and yelled in a rage, I'm not letting my ship get shot out from under my ass. Open fire! And with that, Bismarck's guns roared to life. At this moment, however, Admiral Holland felt that he had closed in close enough to commence the fight proper and turned broadside on so he could bring Hood's aft guns into the fight along with Prince of Wales's. This change of direction threw off Bismarck's gunners as the first salvo went wide. The amount of fire coming from the Royal Navy ship's feet reached a fever pitch as the other batteries joined the fray. However, this confidence turned into consternation when Bismarck's second salvo straddled Hood along her length. The Germans had finally decided to put their vaunted rangefinders to the test, and their efficacy was now no longer in dispute. Hood returned fire but failed to score hits. Prince of Wales, meanwhile, was bracketing Bismarck in an attempt to repeat her initial success, but with no luck. Prince Eugen was using her rapid-firing smaller calibre guns to harass Prince of Wales, and those impacts were now getting awfully close. And then... Tragedy. Bismarck's third salvo lit up the early morning skies. Most of the shells fell wide except one. That shell detonated in Hood's aft magazine. The ship blew in half, evaporating most of the crew. The stern sank almost immediately, having been shattered into small pieces. Her turrets blown clean off the ship. The bow, meanwhile, raised up into the air at a 90 degree angle and began sinking stern first. Just before her bow sank beneath the waves, the crew inside the forward turret, knowing escape was impossible, fired a last defiant salvo. It was almost as though they were proclaiming that while Hood may be dying, her spirit will live on, and she will have her vengeance. They had no way of knowing how right they would be. As this thundering detonation cracked the early morning skies, Prince of Wales was rocked by the explosion. Her crew in absolute disbelief at what had just occurred. Bismarck's crew, however, in a show of icy Teutonic discipline, shifted targets and fired at Prince of Wales, scoring a direct hit on the bridge, killing everyone except the captain and one or two other officers. At the same time, Prince Eugen maintained her fire, and soon shell after shell from the German ships slammed into the stricken Royal Navy vessel. By this time, Captain Leach had realised that the situation was hopeless, his main batteries had been suffering faults since the start of the engagement, and now, combine that with the damage she was taking, she was now outgunned as well as outnumbered. What's worse is that the torpedo teams on Prince Eugen were now seen to be turning her tubes. He made the decision as any sane man would. He decided, in the words of our generation, to fucking leg it and get out of there as fast as he possibly could. Prince of Wales turned away and ran at flank speed, breaking off the action as fast as she could go. Cheers begun to ring out across the German vessels, as the vaunted Royal Navy, their mighty honorary flagship sunk, their newest battleship crippled, ran with their tails between their legs. Captain Lindemann immediately turned to Lutjens. The British home fleet is still at Scarpa Flow and will take time to get here. With the damage done to Prince of Wales and their own damage now well under control, they had an opportunity to chase them down and finish them off. With Bismarck's speed, they could do so if they wished. Lutjens, however, denied that request, stating that orders were to avoid contact with the British at all cost and sink convoys, and that he would not risk the Bismarck in another surface action. Lindemann was furious, but as they say, orders are orders. It's up for debate whether Lutjens made the right call or not. I personally am a more tactically minded person than strategic, and so I agree with Lindemann that given the ability to destroy Prince of Wales, they should have done so. 
She was unable to fight back, and should they have chosen to close and destroy, it would have been an easy win. In fact, the man with Dirty Siegfried on his lip agreed, saying at his home in Berchtesgaden, If now the British cruisers are maintaining contact, and Lutjens has sunk the hood and nearly crippled the other, which is brand new and having trouble with her guns, why doesn't he sink her too? But, in Lutjens' defence, Bismarck was trailing oil and suffering a slight list. Her speed was slower and her progress now easy to spot. The odds of Bismarck being able to evade detection was greatly diminished, and should she pursue Prince of Wales, they would almost certainly be heading straight into a relief force. In any case, Lutjens decided that the best course of action would be to send Eugen off to sink her own convoys, and for Bismarck to head to Brest. There she could repair, rearm, and link up with Scharnhorst and Neisenau for further operations. Meanwhile, in the British camp, there was only one word to describe their mood. And that was disbelief. HMS Suffolk and Norfolk had watched on helplessly as their comrades had been blown to pieces, and now they stuck close to Bismarck. They were going to keep contact with her at all costs, in the hope that more reinforcements could be sent. That evening, the lights at Admiralty House in London, as well as those of Number 10 Downing Street, stayed lit well into the evening. Decisions and discussions were underway regarding how they should proceed. However, given that it was Winston take the straits using Aussies as bait Churchill in charge, there was never any doubt to the outcome of these deliberations. Sir, message from the Admiralty. Message reads, From First Lord of the Admiralty, Commander-in-Chief Home Fleet to all Royal Navy ships in the Atlantic, priority change to standing orders. Orders are as follows. Sink the Bismarck. Their orders were clear. Their mission was simple and their resolve was without question. There was now only one thought in the minds of the Royal Navy. Vengeance. And in a touch of beautiful poetic happenstance for historians and writers like myself, although they would not take part in the final battle, the first ships called to join home fleet from the surrounding area were Revenge-class battleships, HMS Revenge and HMS Ramillies. Their job was to cut off Bismarck's chances of retreating north, with Revenge sortieing from Halifax, while Ramillies detached from a nearby convoy. The main force, meanwhile, was a motley crew of the Royal Navy's finest. The heavy hitters would be the modern battleships and heavy cruisers of the home fleet, and the quick response units of Force H, who were now sailing from Gibraltar with carrier Ark Royal in the lead, backed up by battlecruiser HMS Renown and light cruiser HMS Sheffield. Meanwhile, home fleet's reinforcements started turning an already powerful force into something truly terrifying. As battleships HMS Rodney and King George V began their pursuit alongside Renown's sister ship Repulse and heavy cruiser Dorsetshire. They were escorted by the 4th Destroyer Flotilla, with HMS Maori, HMS Zulu, HMS Sikh, HMS Cossack, and the Polish destroyer Piorun, which is Polish for Thunderbolt. And bringing up the rear of this veritable force of nature was aircraft carrier HMS Victorious. Prince of Wales, on the other hand, having recovered from her ordeal slightly, had worked to become battle ready, with 9 of her 10 guns being brought back online. She linked up with Suffolk and Norfolk, and began shadowing Bismarck alongside of them. Bismarck was running for France. On board our titular ship, meanwhile, titular being a very apt word for given her design in Azure Lane, Bismarck was preparing to detach Prince Eugen for commerce raiding operations. A large rain squall had settled over both the pursuers and the pursued as they forged their way south. And at 1814 on the 24th of May, 
Prince Eugen made a dash for the open sea. The cruiser force following made moves to chase, however this did not occur. In the beginning of this video I called Bismarck Leviathan after the biblical sea monster, and though true it is definitely flowery language, it definitely fits the scene that greeted the British shadowing force. Out of the rain squall ahead of them, Bismarck appeared as a ghostly form, emerging from the mist to bring death, her main battery firing on Prince of Wales. In what amounted to panicked confusion, the British force returned fire. However, due to the weather conditions and the time of day, no hits were scored on either side. But Bismarck had held the British at bay, and thus Prince Eugen vanished and slinked off into the night. With Prince Eugen successfully detached, Bismarck immediately resumed course to Bress at all possible speed, and the chase once again resumed. Only now Bismarck was alone, and help was a long way away. That said, however, despite her damage, Bismarck was still capable of a comfortable 28 knots. Given that the Nelson Revenge and King George V classes were all slower than this, King George V could hit 30 for short periods, but not sustained, the British had to slow Bismarck down somehow. There was, of course, only one option. The senior service would have to swallow its pride and rely not on their famous gunnery, but on the bravery and, let's be honest, the sheer madness of her aviators. The first among these magnificent men in their flying machines were the men of 825 Naval Air Squadron. They were an inexperienced crew, a fresh squadron which had just completed carrier training aboard HMS Victorious, and now they were being asked to take on the most heavily defended ship in the Kriegsmarine when it comes to anti-aircraft defences. But to quote the famous German fighter pilot Manfred von Richthofen, more commonly known as the Red Baron, When it comes to who I like fighting, I prefer those daring rascals the English. Frequently their bravery can only be described as stupidity. However, in their eyes it may be considered pluck and daring. In the years since World War I, the suicidal bravery of British and Commonwealth airmen had not diminished. In fact, since then it's probably gotten more insane. Any of you veterans who have had the misfortune of flying with Australians can confirm this to the others in the comments. In any case, these young men climbed into their fairy-made aircraft, six fairy fulmars and nine fairy swordfish in all, and they set off to find their prey. The hunting was good, they thought especially seeing as they spotted a large warship in the late evening gloom. Lining up on their attack run, they noted frantic light signals coming from their target. The vessel they were attacking was not Bismarck or Prince Eugen, it was HMS Norfolk, who didn't take kindly to these newbie pilots trying to sink their ship. Well, that was almost a tragedy. But thankfully, with their training and the now fresh lesson of positively identifying a target, this won't happen again. Their hunt resumed, and at last, finally the enemy was sighted. The swordfish formed up for an attack run. Their target had nowhere to go. Hits were guaranteed. But again, something was off. There's no AA fire coming their way, and... Doesn't this ship seem a bit small to you? At the last moment, the flight leader broke off the attack in a panic. Yet again... They had lined up on a ship that wasn't their target. The crew of the US Coast Guard cutter Modoc thought perhaps they were conducting a training exercise or something. Alas, yet another mistake from our intrepid swordfish pilots. But at least this time they weren't attacking actual sailors. <laughs> Just kidding, Coasties. I'm sorry. I'm friends with a lot of Army, Navy, and Air Force guys, and they demanded that I put that one in there. Semper Paratus, we love you. Okay, just one more. However, all this buzzing about did help them find Bismarck in a way, which they spotted immediately after. How? Well, because with all this dicking around attacking friendlies, the AA gunners on Bismarck who was nearby, had gained a firing solution, and honestly, I'm pretty sure they kind of felt sorry for them. 
And so they opened fire. Finally! The Swordfish squad, low on fuel and with one last chance, finally lined up on the right target, after it unleashed an ungodly amount of fire in their direction. And let's be clear about this, Bismarck's gunners were not fucking around. Going so far as to fire the main guns to cause geysers in an attempt to sink the attacking swordfish. However, in a bizarre twist of luck, the slow and outmoded design of the fairy swordfish meant that it flew too low and slow for Bismarck's AAA radars and the higher mounted AA batteries, which couldn't traverse low enough to get a shot. The swordfish released their torpedoes, which Bismarck, using her excellent rudder authority, promptly dodged. The attack wasn't coordinated very well, and so of the nine torpedoes launched, eight were successfully evaded. However, the ninth was a direct hit amidships. This killed one crew member due to throwing him into a bulkhead, while slightly damaging some of the previously malfunctioning generator equipment. Ironically enough, it wasn't the torpedo that caused the problems. Due to the rapid maneuvers that Bismarck undertook to avoid the attack, the damage control patches and the collision mats, and all the measures they had taken to repair or prop up the already weakened structures damaged by Prince of Wales, all of them gave way during the rapid changes in speed and heading, which resulted in the flooding of a second boiler room, slowing the ship to 18 knots. However, with damage control now frantically underway, the mats were replaced and the patches reinforced, and of course, the old boiler brought back online. Bismarck's speed slowly climbed back up again. But A25 Squadron had bought time. But not enough. As the swordfish departed, Bismarck and Prince of Wales traded another few salvos, which at this point was kind of becoming a routine. It was as though they wanted to remind her that the Royal Navy hadn't gone anywhere. But by the morning of the 25th, the situation was under control, and now the Germans were making headway. They had recovered the fuel from the forward tanks, patched the holes, and they were now underway at Max Cruise, making 20 knots comfortably. What was worse news for the British is that Bismarck had made it into the open sea around the western approaches, U-boat territory. Meaning that to avoid being attacked by potential Kriegsmarine reinforcements, they had to zigzag. And unfortunately, when the British zigged, the Bismarck zagged. She was gone. No radar contact. Just gone. Had she gone west to link up with an oiler to continue the raids on convoys? Or was she going to France? Or worse, was she rounding on us right now to fight? Norfolk and Suffolk had no idea. And with their own fuel bunkers running low, the situation could not be worse. The Royal Navy fanned out in a search pattern, desperately trying to find her, but with no luck at all. Coastal Command Catalina flying boats which scrambled from Northern Ireland, but the searchers turned up nothing. Bismarck was gone. However, as the wheels of history turn, they often turn on the smallest of details. Lutyens, while steaming ahead, had not noticed that he had lost their pursuers, and as such he kept in regular communications with Berlin. His transmissions on several occasions specifically mentioned Brest, as well as requests for reinforcements, as well as Luftwaffe support. The Focke-Wulf 200 Condor had substantial range and a reputation for being deadly at anti-shipping. If Bismarck could get just a bit closer to France, she could be saved. These transmissions were picked up by the British fleet, but until Bletchley got back to them with the decoded messages, they would have to work off signal triangulation. Given the transmissions, their origin, and the relative location to home fleet, the bearing calculated made it look like that upon shaking Norfolk and Suffolk, Bismarck had swung north to throw their pursuers off, sneaking back to Germany via the Denmark Strait. Home fleet turned to pursue. It was a catastrophic error. Their bearings were right. Their heading, the opposite. 
Essentially, they had mirrored Bismarck's course the other way. Seven hours later, urgent communications arrived. The decoded messages from Bletchley Park mentioned the Luftwaffe Maritime Squadrons moving to the western coast of France, and Brest Harbour preparing themselves for the arrival of Bismarck. Admiral Tovey's heart sank. There was absolutely no way his forces could catch Bismarck now after that wild goose chase, even if they did find her. It looked as if she was going to get away. At 10.30am on the 26th of May, a British Catalina, flown from Ireland by an American pilot, spotted a long, dark oil slick on the water, heading directly for northern France. And soon Bismarck came into view with her guns spitting fire at the offending aircraft. After reporting her position, Admiral Tovey realised that his assessment was correct. They had been going in the wrong direction. Bismarck was now 800 miles away from France and moving fast. Given how far away they were, their low fuel reserves, and the RAF unable to reach out that far safely, the Royal Navy had no hope of success. Bismarck was going to get away for sure. But then the realisation dawned. When the order to sink the Bismarck had been given, it had gone out to all ships in the region, which had included Gibraltar's Force H. They had been hauling ass north as fast as they could while all of this had been going on. If, and it was a big if, they could engage Bismarck and somehow disable her, they may have a chance. But it was a small one. Tovey immediately got in touch with Force H and apprised Admiral Somerville of the dire circumstances. Bismarck would reach German defences in less than a day, they had one shot at this. They had to go now, and he had to make it count. Admiral Somerville acted immediately. HMS Sheffield, the fastest ship in his force, detached and went to flank speed to shadow Bismarck, ensuring that she couldn't sneak away again. Ark Royal, meanwhile, armed her aircraft with brand new magnetic torpedoes. These improved weapons, it was hoped, would rupture Bismarck's hull by detonating under the main armour belt. This was their first combat trial in the Atlantic, and it was hoped they would prove decisive. And so the swordfish took to the air, armed and ready to fight. However, clouds and the constantly shifting tactical situation made navigation difficult. But in the distance, they could just make out a large warship steaming towards France. Ark Royal's pilots dived into the fray, their fingers on the trigger, lining up their target with expert precision. They wouldn't make the same mistake their colleagues from Victorious had made. The lookouts on HMS Sheffield, meanwhile, were unsure as to why their friends from Ark Royal were rallying on their position. She had been transmitting range and bearing updates on Bismarck all afternoon. But soon it became very apparent exactly why her friends from Ark Royal were forming up on them. The swordfish formed up in line abreast and began their attack run. Sheffield frantically started signalling the pilots, but to no avail. Ark Royal's pilots were seasoned professionals, and knowing for certain that Bismarck was well and truly alone, they would never fall for such devious Nazi tricks like signalling they were friendly. The torpedoes released with perfect accuracy. They couldn't possibly miss. However, they started exploding the moment they hit the water. Only one or two of the torpedoes successfully deployed, one of which was dodged, while the other bounced harmlessly off Sheffield's hull. The vaunted magnetic detonators were too sensitive to impact. They blew up when they hit the water. And those that weren't set off were either because the impact broke the mechanism entirely, or the cold Atlantic waters prevented the primer from igniting. Going back to Azure Lane for a moment here... Knowing Sheffield's character and knowing her attitude and knowing just how annoying Ark Royal is, I could not imagine a worse situation. Because of all the girls in Azure Lane, number one on the not-to-be-fucked-with list is most definitely Sheffield. 
This girl is straight up Yandere Kudere Fusion who runs around dual wielding gats like Lara Croft in a maid outfit. If it weren't for the good nature of Angel Lane as an organization, I would hazard a guess that Ark Royal would be begging for a fight with the Sirens after five minutes with Sheffy. Anyway, back to the story. Upon return to Ark Royal, the pilots return to the ready room for a cup of tea to reflect on their error, while the captain was probably profusely apologising to Sheffield. The deck crew loaded the original contact torpedoes as fast as they could. Light was fading and Bismarck was closing into friendly waters. This was it. Last chance. The very last chance. This attack had to work. If it didn't, it was game, set, and match to the Kriegsmarine. The swordfish took off. The pilots fully aware that all the hopes, all the dreams of the Royal Navy, all of the hope that remained, rested on their shoulders. Bismarck, meanwhile, presumably after their crew had finished cackling with laughter at what had just transpired, managed to get a gun solution on Sheffield and engaged. Once again, Bismarck's gunners proved that they were unholy accurate, with their first two salvos straddling Sheffield. Shell splinters killed and wounded some of her crew as the cruiser deployed a smokescreen and withdrew out of range. This little engagement, however, kept Bismarck's attention and showed her location, as at the very same moment, Ark Royal's air wing came sweeping in through the clouds. This was it. Do or die time. Bismarck's AA guns let loose with literally everything they had, and a proverbial hailstorm of flak filled the air. Having slowed slightly while conducting their surface engagement, Bismarck started maneuvering wildly. Captain Lindemann was under no illusions. Those torpedoes weren't the duds that saved that cruiser over there. These torpedoes would work. The efforts to evade undid many of the damage control patches yet again as minor flooding began. The wound in her bow was still causing issues, while the damage to her hull had weakened her lower belt. Yet, a, yet again, with the strong rudder authority of Bismarck and the seamanship of Captain Lindemann, it saved her from damage. But in doing so, she had slowed down too much. A torpedo slammed amidships, rupturing pipes and exacerbating the flooding in the machinery spaces. But that... That was something that she could handle. However, there was something that Bismarck couldn't handle. That something was Lieutenant Jock Moffat and his observer, Dusty Miller. Low on speed, Bismarck immediately began an evasive turn to port, seeing them coming. However, it was straight into the path of this lone swordfish. A swordfish, with its observer hanging out of the cockpit, over the side, lining up a shot. Dusty was sticking his head out with his ass in the air, and he was waiting for a small patch of calm sea to make sure his shot would hit. He found it 20 seconds later. Let her go, Chuck! The torpedo hit the water in a perfect delivery. Maximum speed on touchdown. Bismarck had no chance. She was going to take a hit, and it was going to be a decisive hit. Bismarck was maintaining her left turn in the vain hope she could evade, but she had lost all her speed, and the turn was now no longer violent enough. The torpedo impacted directly into the steering compartment, jamming the rudders and causing severe shock damage throughout the aft section of the ship. As the swordfish withdrew, Admiral Lutjens and Captain Lindemann ordered a damage control report. What they got back was devastating. While they had managed to free one of the rudders, the other was jammed in a hard turn to port. Furthermore, with the asymmetric rudder alignment, the only way to manoeuvre the ship would be to use alternate thrust on the screws. But if you recall, at the start of her sea trials, it was reported that due to her wide beam and displacement, as well as the insufficient power to weight and poor screw placement, asymmetric thrust only granted minor turning capability, and that capability was insufficient to offset the rudder. This flaw that was dismissed in tests 
as an irrelevance or simply too hard to fix, had now, as both officers knew, doomed the ship. Bismarck maintained a slow left turn, turning right into the path of home fleet. At 21.40, Luchin signalled Berlin. Ship unmaneuverable. We will fight to the last shell. Long live der Führer. Captain and crew alike now knew that come the morning, the final act would begin. As Bismarck's ship's bell rang out for one of the last times it would ever ring, the old poem surely came to mind. Do not ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Night had fallen, and aside from another brief skirmish with Sheffield, all was quiet. Bismarck was now a ship of the damned, gliding silently through the night. Having reduced power and attempting to use alternate thrust to steady her course to enable gunnery, should it be necessary. And it would be. Smelling blood in the water, the Royal Navy began to circle like sharks. And like with most shark frenzies, the smaller fish wanted to get their meal in first before the apex predators clean up the rest. The destroyer squadron, which had been escorting the main force, now closed in to shadow Bismarck. And if they could, they'd get some torpedoes in as well. However, given which ship was in front of this formation, shadowing was not going to happen. The Polish destroyer Piorun closed with Bismarck. Yes, the Poles closed on a battleship in a destroyer. Aryan supermen, my ass, the Poles do not give a fuck. In fact, they gave so little of a fuck that when the destroyer broke through the mist and Bismarck's lookout sighted her, they could see her signalling. The signal read, I am a Pole. As soon as this message was finished, all the guns on the destroyer began firing. A literal hail of gunfire emitted from this little ship as she continued to charge down the German battleship. At the range she was at, however, there was no risk of damage. And so Bismarck returned fire. Yet still this little destroyer kept coming at them. So they fired another salvo, and this salvo straddled the destroyer, and yet she still kept coming. Another salvo was fired, and finally, the near misses forced her to disengage. But not before she sent an entire constellation of star shells over the top of Bismarck. This illuminated her for torpedo attacks by the other destroyers. These would prove ineffective, however, as she remained out of range. Bismarck's guns were still too much of a threat to get really close, as HMS Cossack found out when a 15-inch shell sheared off her antenna. But the result of these attacks meant that none of the Germans got any sleep that night. The dawn was fast approaching, and along with it, Judgment Day. As the sun began to crest on the eastern horizon, the pilot of Bismarck's scout aircraft prepared to take off. The ship's war diary, film and photos of her voyage, and other important documents were loaded aboard. However, when readying for launch, the damage inflicted by Prince of Wales' second shell was discovered. The steam line to the catapult was non-functional. The important cargo was retrieved, and the aircraft discarded over the side. After all, an aircraft full of fuel and rear gun ammo was not a good thing to have on deck if it was not going to be able to do anything, and there's going to be shells and machine gun fire and god knows what else flying about. And anyway, in a few hours it wouldn't even matter. Dawn broke, and the sky began to clear. The darkness slowly sweeping away 
like the curtain rising on the final act of an opera. And appropriately, the scene was that of a Wagnerian opera. The Twilight of the Gods and the Tale of Ragnarok. Gotterdammerung. The gods of battle on each side prepared to clash for the final time. Only now it was not Asgard that would burn, but a ship. Bismarck would burn and sink into the abyss. Her life would be extinguished so that a new world, a peaceful world, a just world could be born. But first a price had to be paid. A price paid in iron and blood. Though the storm of war would be the strongest storm on the 27th of May 1941, Mother Nature would not let herself be outdone. A high altitude overcast blanketed the sky. The entire world was grey as the North Atlantic whipped up into a frenzy. Gale force winds blew and the Royal Navy deployed accordingly. Approaching with the wind behind them, King George V and Rodney spotted Bismarck at 0843 and the two ships closed on their target, breaking formation to attack independently. And at 0847, it began. HMS Rodney fired a full broadside salvo at Bismarck, who was still crippled and unable to manoeuvre. However, in a bizarre twist, this aided Bismarck as due to the high winds and the damaged steering, accurate gunnery was harder because course and speed was more of a guess than a calculable variable. But for Bismarck, this wasn't an issue, and for the last time her exceptional rangefinders and talented gunners would demonstrate their prowess. Straddling Rodney with her first two salvos. But this time... This time, that gunnery would not save her. Rodney replied in kind, and at 0902, a 16-inch salvo blasted Bismarck's superstructure and forward section. Most of the senior officers were killed, the main fire control director was wrecked, and the bridge was cut in half. Anton and Bruno turrets were rendered inoperable as the shock of the impacts wrecked their mechanisms. Not that it mattered, as they had no way to effectively spot, range, and engage targets anyway, with their fire control radar and their fire control systems gone. To the rear of the ship, the aft fire control station took over direction of Caesar and Dora, the aft turrets, but due to the inability of Bismarck to change course and speed, the rough seas, and the lack of their primary fire control station, their task was a hopeless one. Furthermore, the primary electrical systems for both targeting and the main battery had their cables running over the exterior of the Citadel instead of under its protection, and as a result, it was a lottery as to whether any of her batteries could fire at all. However, in the end, it didn't matter. Bismarck up to now had demonstrated world-class shooting, but now her four-gun salvos became more of a symbol of defiance than accurate gunnery. King George V stood off at a distance, raining plunging fire into Bismarck, attempting to penetrate her deck armour. Rodney, meanwhile, closed in and fired the only torpedo salver from one battleship to another to actually score a hit. All this time, both her main guns and secondaries were pummeling Bismarck at point-blank range, reducing the superstructure into a molten, mangled pile of slag scrap. Seeing that their quarry had stopped firing her main batteries, the cruisers Norfolk and Dorsetshire joined this firing line, adding their own 8-inch guns to the fusillade. The range was now 3,000 yards, and every shell fired was hitting home, pummeling into the side of her hull. But despite this volume of fire and the incredibly short range, the Citadel and Belt armor held. Bismarck stayed afloat, defiantly refusing to capitulate, like her namesake, she would not go down unless she was put down. But while the hull remained afloat, the superstructure and the interior were now engulfed in flames. Bismarck was alight from bow to fantail, 
The damage control patches in the steering compartment had ruptured, and she was beginning to list to port while sinking by the stern. The British ships had fired over 2,000 shells by now, to the point that the primary armor belt on Bismarck was glowing red from the amount of kinetic energy going through it. It was at this point that the last senior officer aboard Bismarck, First Officer Hand Earls, called abandoned ship, while ordering engineering to open all watertight doors and place scuttling charges. She may be defeated, but the crew was determined. She would go out on their terms, not the Royal Navy's. As this final drama was playing out, the Kriegsmarine's reinforcements had begun to arrive. U-74 was heading towards the area, armed and ready to assist, but already on station was Bismarck's sister, U-boat U-556. While the stricken battleship struggled valiantly against the inevitable, U-556's story was a story of despair. While Ark Royal had been preparing to launch the raid that damaged Bismarck's steering gear the previous day, U-556 had been right there next to her watching. Had she had any torpedoes, she would have sunk Ark Royal, and the fatal moment that doomed Bismarck would not have taken place. But as she was on return from a successful raiding patrol, there was no armament left besides their main gun. And with the battlecruiser Renown parked alongside Ark Royal, that was not an option. And so while Bismarck was in her death throes, her honorary sister ship U-556 and her crew sat by helplessly as their friends began to abandon ship, falling into the freezing water of the North Atlantic. The gale force winds whipping up the surface into a maelstrom which few men could endure and they were powerless to help. Low on fuel and unarmed, there was nothing U-556 could do. She handed her patrol station off to U-boat U-74 and returned to base at Lorient, wishing things were different. Despite them fighting for Nazi Germany, I can't help but feel terrible for the crew of U-556. To know that your good friends and comrades who you trained with and served with were dying en masse at the mercy of the enemy right across from you. These were your best friends while you were training up to commission. They're right over there and there is nothing you can do to help them. You don't even have enough fuel to go and look for survivors. To me, it's moments like this that hammer home why war should be the last resort, and not the first resort as so many politicians seem to think it should be. In the end, however, it didn't matter. Nothing could save Bismarck now. The scuttling charges went off at 10.20, and Bismarck lurched further to port. Admiral Tovey called a ceasefire. His ships were low on fuel and they needed to head back. He ordered Dorsetshire to finish Bismarck off with a torpedo attack, to which Dorsetshire obliged. She launched as ordered. However, Bismarck's list was so pronounced that one of the torpedoes actually hit what remained of the superstructure. There was no doubt about it. This was the end. The sound of guns, the shriek of shell fire, the whoosh of torpedoes, they all died away, and only the crashing of waves against steel could be heard. At 10.40 on the 27th of May, 1941, battleship Bismarck slipped beneath the waves, plummeting to the sea floor, shedding her turrets and superstructure she hit the edge of an extinct underwater volcano and slid down the mountain, coming to rest upright and intact. She was defiant to the end, defeated but not dishonoured. 
Dorsetshire and the destroyer Maori started rescuing survivors from the water. But they had to abandon the effort as they had detected U-boat U-74 approaching the scene. Many of those who had escaped the inferno now froze to death or drowned in the Atlantic swell, with only five men picked up by Germans. From Bismarck's crew of over 2,200 men, there were only 115 survivors. 114 men, and if rumours are to be believed, one cat. Oscar later known as Unsinkable Sam. Despite this victory, there were no cheers on the Royal Navy vessels, no elation or celebration. If there were any positive feelings, they were of grim satisfaction or exhausted relief. Exercise Rhine was over. The hunt for Battleship Bismarck successful. In seven days of fighting across the North Atlantic, the Royal Navy had lost the pride of their fleet and their newest battleship had been crippled. Her cruiser force, meanwhile, were battered, bruised and exhausted. Germany, meanwhile, had lost its flagship and Prince Eugen's mission, even though she successfully got away, was failing due to mechanical failures and faults with her engines. But what we must not forget is the most important statistic of this. Those seven days in the North Atlantic cost the lives of 3,700 brave young men. And there the story remained until 1989 when Robert Ballard, the man who discovered RMS Titanic, discovered the wreck of Battleship Bismarck, standing upright on the sea floor. Her secondary armament still intact, as though it were menacing the local sea creatures. Upon examination of the wreck with their remote submersible Argo, they confirmed that Bismarck's main belt and her deck armour were intact. In fact, all the holes they did find were either above the waterline or in what remained of the superstructure. All the compartments were open and no implosions caused by air pockets could be seen. The terror of the seas had defied the British one last time. Bismarck had been scuttled. This story has been told in film and documentary, in book and poem even, in song. This story has been told so many times and I have just told it yet again. But it is a story that, as Henry V would put it, the good man would teach his son. A story of determination and defiance. A story of hope and despair. A story of heroism and drama and surviving against the odds and succeeding despite the odds. It still captivates me and captivates all of you to this day. Bismarck had to fall. Just as the regime she served had to fall. For the good of humanity, the destruction of that evil was necessary. And yet I mentioned Wagner's Gotterdammerung 
for a reason. When Asgard fell to war and ruin, Midgard and hell burned with it. Our world was caught in a conflagration that saw the deaths of 75 million people. And yet when that fire was extinguished, there was a new world born from the ashes. A world which swore upon its very soul that no such war would ever happen again. And while that hope for peace is most likely a forlorn hope, it is a spirit we must keep alive. And if there is one thing I know for sure, as long as we live, for better or worse, for as long as we live, we shall never forget the name. Bismarck.